Hi, this is Gary Yelton with Electronic Musician. I'm here at Streamside Concerts in Asheville, North Carolina with synthesis composer and electronic music performer Robert Rich, who's here for two nights of house concerts. How are you doing, Robert? I'm doing great. This is a beautiful place. How are you enjoying your stay in Asheville? I love Asheville, actually. <laughs> it's, uh, this is my second time here, but my first time to actually uh, just relax and enjoy the countryside a bit. Well, welcome. Uh, I asked Robert if he would be uh, kind enough to show us around his rather substantial rig here, and uh, he said he would. So, Robert, why don't you show us what you have? Okay. This is actually meant to be a, a light rig. Um, in the past, I've toured with a big uh, 5U MOTM modular system, but this is uh, about a year-old configuration of uh, Eurorack stuff, mostly with um, synthesis technology modules and IntelliGel mod modules. Um, Paul Schreiber at Synthesis Technology is a friend, and I've done some design work with him. The, the Morphing Terrarium uh, has single-cycle wavetables that I designed for it. Um, about, I don't know, maybe it, it has a total of 192 wavetables, and I think I made about 120 of them or so. Um, we were trying to create something using, using like the, the PPG approach of scanning through wavetables, right. but the new technology allowed them to make it much more smooth morphing between them, and so we thought it would be fun to try to create a more logical sequence of, of tonalities, and that was my job for about two or three months to, to try to create a, con a concept of wavetables that would work in a grid sort of from dark to bright as you scan through them. Um, the IntelliGel stuff is great because it's really high space efficiency. There's like a, a hex VCA and four envelopes, you know, dual envelopes. Um, so I can get a whole bunch of voices and activity just with minimal number of modules. This is actually a four voice synth. Um, the, the channel one MIDI is mostly for keyboard playing. So this is, you know, a, basically a bass line. digital sound source. Yeah, actually, these are hybrid modules, and I've felt for years that that's really the future of quote-unquote analog. Uh, I've been uh, trying to encourage the designers to, to make more use of the hybrid technology, because what we have now is a lot of these that act like analog modules, they're in fact digital guts, right? So we can we can do now things with memory that's built into these chips. These are like arm chips and things like that. It was configured as uh, four voices, and it's just MIDI channels one through four. Uh, the first channel is mostly kind of a solo bass line with the cloud oscillator. Uh, the cloud generator is basically eight, up, up to eight oscillators with a spread control. So, you know, you can start making a fat sound. or just make standard solo lines. Um, but then the, uh, the other three voices are using the Morphing Terrarium. And I'm, in this tour, I'm mostly using them for melodic uh, sequencer parts that uh, go along with the album filaments. And so I have those coming from Ableton. So for example, um, you know, here, this is the main element to, um, to a piece on filaments called Laniakia. And, uh, of the performance is that with, with Ableton on its own using clips, it can start feeling a little bit like karaoke. And it works great if it's dance music where the audience is the concert, really. But in my case, the music is a little bit more um, kind of introverted. And, and, I, and I, when I'm performing it, I want to be able to interact with it more. 
So I'm still using Ableton for its traditional kind of clip launching, and you know, uh, sometimes it gets a little bit like Music Minus One, where I've got a lot of the uh, audio studio mangled parts that really are, were never live to start with, and they're coming in audio off the computer. And then I've got keyboard and guitar and flute parts, which I can then, you know, there's loopers, you know, throughout the setup. There's a Roland looper here on the guitar and on the, the Boss uh, uh, ME70, there's loopers in there too. So I can have two different layers of looping going on. Um, and then for the microphone, there's a Line 6 Echo Pro over here, which then I can set up loops there. And so the whole thing is a little bit like spinning plates. Oh, I imagine. Um, you know, you can, you can get several things going and crossfade between events that are happening. And to both the audience and to myself, it feels more uh, real-time, more expressive, more interactive than if it's just launching clips. Um, and probably people who uh, made Ableton Live would think I'm sort of underusing it. I'm really kind of using it in a very crude way, almost like, you know, just a push push play on a CD player almost. Kind of an extension sampler? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's drones and there's rhythms, um, and I can improvise with those, and I've got various squelchy bits that I've made on the modular synth back at home, and they, you know, get all mangled, and then they end up as little bits that I can interject with other things. So the sources of your clips are uh, snippets that you've recorded of your own stuff? Yeah, always. Um, I, I've basically made a point to always make my own patches on synths, make my own samples for the samplers, and, um, you know, play what I know how to play in order to get sounds that are my own instead of the infinite range of sounds that we can get by going through libraries and things. I'd rather make a sound that's unique to what's in my vocabulary rather than sit there and spending a day going through a million libraries and finding something that fits. You know. That makes too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other way is boring. I mean, it's it's much more fun to make sounds and to play with sound. Yes. So um, to me, I don't really care if it sounds like a perfect trombone or whatever, I'd rather make it sound like something that nobody's heard or, you know, I play a handful of instruments, not very well, flute, guitar, things like lap steel guitar, even not even normal guitar. So just getting what I can out of the things I know how to do, you know. One thing that caught my ear were your uh, natural sounds, like animals and insects, that sort of things. What are the sources of those? Uh, recordings I've made, uh -huh. or oftentimes modular synth um, Emulations of critters that don't really exist. That's what I thought. That's yeah. what I thought because uh, they sound they had sounded very realistic, but not quite. Yeah, yeah. I, I love uh, to to set up patches on modulars that kind of blurp and twitter and, and yes. sizzle and clack, and they kind of become virtual forests. Do you record natural sounds and then emulate those, or? Well, actually, sometimes what I'll do is I'll mix a little bit of natural sound with synthetic sounds, oh. and so the synthetic sounds fit into a context that tricks the ear to think that, you know, gee, those are actual grasshoppers and crickets, but that's a strange whale-like bird call that comes in underneath it, you know. That's and great. Just kind of creates a sense of evocative space. You know. Excellent. So those are synthesized animals? Yeah. Those are actually, um, are they still playing? Yeah, there we go. I think I did those on a, on a sequential six track back in 1985. Wow. <laughs> so um, the Prophet 12 is actually uh, something I'm taking with me on tour for the first time uh, on this tour. It's uh, something I was involved with doing presets for. And I've been friends with the folks, the old sequential circuits folks and with Dave Smith for years. Um, some of the folks that I played in bands with back when I was a teenager were at Sequential. And uh, so we have this long relationship of sometimes me making weird sounds for them. And so this actually has uh, about eight of the wavetables in the digital oscillators are loops that I've made for them, including my voice. Um, so it's kind of funny because if you play middle E with just the um, just one oscillator and no other processes, it'll sound like me. <laughs> so these are the factory sounds. Uh, that well, you created? Yeah, the actual on-chip sounds, the, the, the oscillator single-cycle wavetables. 
um, there, it has, I think, about 16 wavetables. And um, there was another guy who did like most of the heavy lifting on that, but I did a, a handful of them, maybe six or eight, I think they used mine. Um, but then for this and the Pro 2, um, I've been doing some presets for them as well, along with a team of probably six other sound designers that mm -hmm. are all pitching in to do the preset designs. So I, I mean, it's part of the advantage of really liking to make my own sounds is that eventually you get people asking you to do that for them too. And so it's kind of an extra part of surviving, I guess, the career, you know. And I see you're using a Korg M3. I, that's a particularly under appreciated instrument, I think. I love the M3. I use it heavily for, um, uh, you know, I usually have keyboard splits. In this case, for example, um, on this tour, I'm playing a really old piece uh, with all live electronics. And so um, the Prophet 5, there, Prophet 5, listen to me, the Prophet 12 I'm using for these arpeggiators. And then for this, I'm uh, using the keyboard split features uh, to put on the drum pad some loops that I've created that, that I have just stretched way over to the uh, ends of the keyboard. So I just hold down uh, a pad with a weight and... Those are lead weights? Yeah, those are fishing weights. Oh. They're, I think they're not lead, they're hot metal. Okay. I think lead is illegal now. Oh, so. I see. But so like, that's like a layered riffly sequence of, you know, multiple overdubs of analog modular with tons of delay, so it kind of has that soft, blurry sound. Yes. Which, um, I confess, I think Michael Stearns is probably the person who does it best, and I just kind of, I like what Michael does, so sometimes I'll borrow. <laughs> Everybody does. And then, you know, so likewise over here, for example, I've got um, a, a drone that I'll be using later in the piece, midway through the piece. Um, those are two different loops of processed bowed metal or something. I forget what I did for those samples. But at the same time, though, I've got a keyboard doing... So I've got a string sound up here, which which will be played through MIDI because I'll be busy playing the guitar. Um, and then here, a, a low keyboard sound. And this is actually a sample I made of my old Prophet 5. I had certain sounds on that that I could never get the same way in any other way. And before I sold it, I sampled a few precious sounds from it. Of course. And this is one of them. It's just this very smooth, big bunch of uh, pulse width modulated square waves, you know, and so it just has a soft, and so, you know, that's, that's one of the lead sounds in that piece. So with these setups like this, I can go from complex, you know, layers of, of sounds, including like here, I think I have some like strange blurpy underwater kind of modular like sounds. And what was the source of those sounds? Analog modular. Uh huh. Yeah. So, you know, and those are just loops that are samples and then imported into the M3. Um, it's just a very powerful, good sounding synth. I mean, it has really nice piano, very usable. And um, it's it's a workhorse for, for sleep concerts. I actually have a whole bunch of um, kind of drone things using the Karma software, where I've got the tempo slope way, way down, and I'm using Karma to help me just create hands-free drones, you know, so I can just kind of do that, and then I can mix different layers. So this becomes a mixer, and these are just thick, soft, you know, and so the whole thing becomes a very flexible ambience creator, you oh. know? And this, what I really like about it is that you can take the, the brains out of the keyboard, and so I can travel to Europe or Asia on airplanes and just stick this in, in uh, you know, a safe air container, you know, and it takes a lot less space than that. The organizers provide me with the, uh, with the MIDI keyboard, and um, I can bring all of these sounds in this kind of performance technique um, with me uh, around with, without having as much space to carry things. Um, uh, does the M3 offer you uh, features that the other Korgs do not? 
Well, I think, I mean, just the fact that it, it, it has the portability factor of pulling the brains out and the pads and everything. It's just, at the time, it was exactly what I needed, and I haven't really seen something that does better than this. Um, I, you know, I have it upgraded with memory to 300 meg, which is its maximum, I think, and so I can load all my own samples in. These days, I guess, for sampling, you know, of course, a laptop does everything you need, and, uh, you know, you must, well, laptops take less space, too, but it's still, it's nice to have a performance interface, and, you know, something that actually gives you the, the way of interacting with, with it. exactly is it you're doing here? Well, bowing the string with a piece of metal. And what is that? Uh, this is a piece of a nut driver set, and the texture is really important. Uh, it has to have just the right kind of smooth roughness. Not too rough, not too smooth. If it's too smooth, it doesn't really make any noise at all. I mean, like if you, if you hear it with, with like a slide, which is meant to be smooth, so it doesn't make noise, it's very quiet. Mm. But if you have too much texture, then it, uh, it, it makes all this scratchy kind of yeah. low frequency sound. The, the problem, though, is that it was really hard to uh, get any other guitar than this to sound right with the way I play it. Um, I had to do a bunch of reverse engineering. This is an old, weird, no-name guitar that I bought from a good friend almost 30 years ago, um, and then modified it with a uh, DiMarzio Super Distortion. And um, something about the combination with the hardware, this, this has a strange lug system where it's got sort of a cam. You can make it almost like a st uh, pedal steel. It has three different tunings. But I don't use that so much. I use it kind of as a, as a hand rest. Part of it, though, is that the nut and the bridge are these metal cylinders. They seem, for some reason, they seem to decouple the low frequency uh, rumble from the pickup. I don't know why. but. When I've tried to make copies of this to be able to play if this gets destroyed or something, um, I finally had to, to have a friend you know, uh, get a CNC milling machine to help me make a uh, bridge and not just like that. So getting this tone really vocal the way I want it has taken some time with the right combinations of hardware and, mm -hmm. and technique. Um, How long have you had this particular instrument? This one since the late 80s, but uh -huh. I had another one that I was using from around 1980 or so, um, which was the kind of uh, trashed up uh, mother of toilet seat magnetone <laughs> that I think I bought at a pawn shop for 80 bucks. Well, they've become a big part of your musical voice. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's I'm a bit apologetic about it because I can't really play lap steel guitar. I sort of use it like six oscillators. For the most part, I use it like a single oscillator. I'll just play one string with the Ebo, you know. For example, I'll just kind of lay the Ebo on it. Okay. So with the Ebo, it's kind of convenient because you can just lay it on there. Although sometimes I get a little bit too rambunctious and it falls off. <laughs> but you know, you can, you can get kind of crazy. string going with the pick and then the uh, Ebo sustains it. Oh, it doesn't even need the pick. I mean, sometimes you just plop it on there and it just does its thing. You know. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just all about creative abuse and finding ways of um, getting expressive sounds out of things. Um, I, I never consider myself a really particularly good player of, of anything, but I spent a lot of time uh, trying to get expressive sounds that are that have sort of a, an emotional an emotional content or a sort of a, something with some energy in it you know well, Robert your flutes your flutes look a little unusual what do you have there well I make them out of PVC pipe it's basically schedule 40 this is one inch PVC this is three quarter inch um, I make different flutes for each piece different tunings I, I do a lot of stuff in just intonation and different tunings and strange modes and things so um, Rather than be simple about it and learn how to play proper silver flute, I, I, I prefer 
making stuff that are a little bit more primitive. Um, so I do some end blown and I do some transverse. I'm probably better at the transverse flutes. I don't know why. I think maybe it's easier to cut the embouchure. Is this what your flutes have always been? I always assumed they were wooden flutes. Uh, I started with bamboo flute, but then what happened was um, I had a hand injury about 10 years ago, which made it impossible for me to stretch uh, to the three holes, and I can't really reach it. So I started duplicating those bamboo flutes with, um, with thumb holes, so that since this hand doesn't really work well, I, I do the thumb so that now you know, this replicates a flute that was in C minor that had three holes up here, but but the thumb hole lets me play it. So it gets a little tricky if you have to do all open. You have to kind of do things with the edges of your hands because there's no way to hold the flute. So you kind of go. So you kind of just, just sort of push on the sides to hold the flute that way. You've developed your own technique. Yeah. And then the, the end blown have a have a, one advantage is that the um, the octaves are more in tune. Something about the physics of of the pipe uh, make it just easier to stay in tune up high. But they're a little trickier to play, especially the lowest notes. successful than others, you know, and some of them, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just use one piece maybe. Like, um, this one is in B flat, and you can see it's, you know, some very close um, intervals in the tuning, but it has a, just a really sweet tone. And maybe I'm just a cheapskate, but I find that I can um, experiment. And you know, I don't like to fill landfill with too much PVC, but it's cheap. And you can get a 10-foot stretch for three or four bucks. And and sometimes after experimenting, I'll get one or two really interesting flutes out of that. And so you know, I've got a corner in the studio that's just full of pipe of different tunings, and I have to mark the names on each one because they all kind of end up looking the same. I see that. You actually have the titles of the uh, tracks that you're using. Yeah, so this is a piece called Transpiration, and it's in B minor. Um, you know, and so... <laughs> with my very sloppy spelling, you know, like, so this is, this is sort of an unusual mode. It's kind of a Turkish mode. It's a sort of a strange B minor, B flat minor with E. And, um, and this is for a piece that's on Elong. Uh, called translucent. And I've used this on a couple of the pieces too. So yeah, it's uh, they each have a character of their own, and it's it just allows for a lot of personality that way. No matter what you play, I mean, there's a lot of virtuosos who don't actually have a whole lot of great ideas, and they're really, really good at playing an instrument, um, and they can sound like almost anybody, but then you ask them to sound like themselves, and they don't know what that is. Um, I wish I were more virtuosic, and I certainly try to get good at, at whatever I play, but I'm more focused on uh, the effect that the music has when it's finished. I, I, I think of the music from the beginning as... Uh, as a gestalt, it's it's an emotional place or something beyond emotion, something with with feelings that are mysterious to me, and and then trying to sculpt the sound so that it becomes a world unto itself. Um, playing a lot of notes fast or playing complex um, harmonies, and you know, I, I like weird time signatures, I confess, but um, I, it just doesn't matter to me. I really I prefer a simple kind of introspective music that just um, draws out um, deep mystery. And yet you deal with complex instruments like modular synthesizers. That's actually kind of my first instrument. I mean, after piano, I, to me that was my home. You know, it doesn't seem complex to me. It's just uh, it's a bunch of wires and knobs and you make it squawk. You know? so <laughs> I, um, I, there's a, just a, a sense of adventure with the modular. You can just sit there and try stuff an experiment, and it encourages that. There's no one way to play it, and there's no specific um, 
right or wrong, you know, and it it brings that aspect of music which I love of the plastic, the the, um, the surreal component, you know, the the ability to to just come up with sounds that you've never heard before and to surprise yourself. Uh, so, it, it, in fact, I think of the modular not so much as analog. I, that it doesn't matter to me if it's analog or digital or or classic or modern or whatever. It's just stuff. I mean, instruments are. Great. There's so many people fetishizing about modular synths right now. Yes. It's you know, you go to these websites and it's really just synth porn, and uh, I I think it's just better to think of them as musical expressive palettes that you um, make sound with. You know, and I uh, I don't think it really matters. But what I really want to see is this evolution of the modular where more DSP and complex uh, audio processing capabilities that we're used to having in plugins uh, can be incorporated with this patch cord and knob metaphor, which encourages so much more experiment and um, improvisation. How did you get started with modular synthesizers? <laughs> you said it was your first instrument besides well, I, the piano. That's... I was 13 years old, and I really wanted to play electronic music, but I didn't have much money. So with paper up money, I'd buy Paya modules. Uh -huh. well, so you know, anybody from that era in the mid-'70s, you know, has John Simonton to thank for making some really crummy sounding electronics that we could all afford and get started. You know, I, t to me, the fact that it wasn't very good made you constantly want to strive to get something better and to get good on it. And it didn't really reward all of that work that well, <laughs> you know, because it just wasn't very good. There was this huge hum and noise floor and this, you know, no stability to the oscillators. But it gave you somewhere to start. It, it gave me a language of, of you know, how to use synths differently, because I couldn't sound like Klaus Schultz or Tangerine Dreams, but I, I, I could sound like Squish Splat Glorp, and it was kind of more fun. So trying to find a vocabulary with, with some, you know, really mediocre electronics made it really feel easy after the stuff got better. Um, and nowadays, we're so spoiled. I mean, the, the software is excellent. We have endless number of tracks. The, the keyboards are stable. Uh, they have myriad memories, and they have deep programmability. The modulars are, are cheap compared to what they used to be. They're very compact, and they're, they're very deep. So um, now I think, if anything, the challenge is finding ways to limit yourself so that you're not frozen by too many options. I think right, the, the, the biggest risk is, is option freeze. You know, It's that way with all of music technology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that finding what you want to do with something, limiting your choices, focusing on on the reason you're making art rather than the tools you're making it with and helps push things forward. So Robert, you're in the midst of a tour. What can you tell us about it? Well, I'm driving around the country and then doing a quick stop over to Copenhagen for a sleep concert. Um, about 14 gigs in six weeks. Um, and this is the East Coast extent, so tomorrow I'll be driving up to Philadelphia for uh, gatherings, and then Boston, and then Denmark. Um, a few gigs after that, and then back home in uh, late May. Well, I hope it all goes well for you, and you have safe travels, and uh, meet lots of new and interesting people, and uh, it's been very nice talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.